in a way, this starts to sound like an argument that we've heard from some of our industry proponents who say, okay, you know, maybe stopping meat altogether would be the best thing, but that's not going to happen. We've got to feed 9 billion people coming down the pike. And so the most efficient and the most environmentally friendly, paradoxically, environmentally friendly way to go here is to intensive methods. So use a small amount of space in a really intensive fashion get the animals up to slaughter weight as quickly as possible so they're you know, not as environmentally damaging, and you get a lot more meat per acre of land or per unit of grain. And uh, that is actually better than this pasture-raised humane thing, at least when yeah. you think about environmental stuff. I seem to recall in Just Food, you say something like that also on behalf of kind of biodiversity. So the idea is like intensive, sort of Norman Borlaug idea, intensively farm monocrop in some small areas, but then leave as much space as possible for biodiversity. Okay, so the industry uh, approach and the answer to that question is, is right and wrong. And okay. here's where it's wrong. I mean, indie, industry can make that argument. The meat industry can make that argument, and they do make that argument. The major problem is that they're making this argument while they're growing massive amounts of corn and soy to feed to their animals. Yeah. So you intensify the system, but, but well, while you're intensifying, intensifying the production of meat per se, you're, um, and even if you're intensifying corn and soy production, you're still using hundreds of millions of acres the wrong way. Hmm. So you're doing the wrong kind of intensification. You're intensifying the wrong products, essentially. And this is an argument that I make to the meat industry all the time. And their argument is, well, what do you propose as an alternative? And when I say you take all the land and the water that's used and the air quality that goes into corn and soy and you take that out mm -hmm. and you use that land in the Midwest to grow a diversity of plant foods for people to eat, do it intensively as you want. Yeah. I have no problem with that. Use all the ag biotechnology that is responsible and safe to use. But growing corn and soy intensively to feed the animals into an intensive system is totally irresponsible and totally goes against the ecological progress that we should be making and mm -hmm. want to make. Taking those resources, and this is why ending domesticated animal agriculture, or at least removing it as much as we can, is so critical. Yeah. As you then use that intensive logic, apply that logic of, intensity, of um, intensification to essentially do what they're doing in California in the Midwest. I mean, if we could take yeah. what's happening in California and take what we're growing in California and grow it throughout the Midwest and the lower Midwest in particular, um, using intensive methods, there is where we would see major gains. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so again, another fairly complicated point that requires sort of several steps to get to, yeah. which is why, I mean, it's the argument that I'm making is the most threatening argument to industrial agriculture that one could make. But I have routinely been identified as a supporter of industrial agriculture because I support intensification methods. Right. What's overlooked is that the kind of intensification I'm talking about is fundamentally different than what's happening in industrial agriculture. So, so you th let me just see if I get it straight. You think that we should intensify in order to leave as much land as possible to just sort of be open and wild and biodiverse, but what we should intensify is not corn and soy and other monocrops for animal feed, but rather stuff that humans can eat in a way that would allow us to feed everybody, though not feed them meat. Exactly. Okay. And by intensification, I mean going so far as to, when we can, remove agriculture from the land itself. I mean, I'm... Yeah. Uh, I very, get very excited about agricultural technologies that um, focus on controlled environments mm -hmm. and lead to, I think, fairly impressive efficiencies with a minimal input of uh, chemical regulation. These things are hopefully in the future, but, you know, they're not if we don't make the shift that I've just discussed right. away from monocultural corn and soy to the more diverse form of growing foods for people to eat. Now, the benefit there is that it does open the possibility of, of, of turning more land over to itself, to mm -hmm. leaving land alone. And mm -hmm. there have been a number of very exciting examples where even desiccated lands out west have been put aside and left to their own resources. And they revive very impressively and achieve levels of biodiversity mm -hmm. that 
are totally unexpected. And I think that's because we don't fully understand how that happens. The most advanced ecologists in the world don't completely understand the complexity of biodiversity. Yeah. So for farmers to come along and say, well, we can recreate biodiversity or you know, create biodiversity has to be taken with a grain of salt. I've seen it happen. I've seen people take landscapes out of corn, for example, and turn it over to, um, I know, a very impressive case of a guy turning a cornfield into a aronia berry farm in Iowa. And the level of biodiversity does increase. He gets more birds. He gets more lizards. He gets more butterflies. But Hmm. Biodiversity is about a lot of things we can't see as well, and I think this is where leaving the land alone and allowing, you know, literally millions, if not billions, of ecological relationships to nourish themselves makes a lot more sense, and frankly, is indicative of a much more humble environmental attitude than a farmer going in and say and saying that he can achieve um, a meaningful level of biodiversity. So when I so when I asked Salatin about this sort of idea, his response is, well, you just don't understand my method. My method actually increases biodiversity. I've got more things going on the polyface farm than you would have anywhere else in the Shenandoah Valley because I'm intentionally promoting even more diversity. And you're saying this is a sort of, no, uh, a does. sort of hubristic effort to mimic nature in a way that might backfire. Is that right? Well, okay, he does. I yeah. think he's right and deserves credit for actually creating a level of biodiversity that compared to other farms, and there's the key term there, yeah. compared to other farms is quite impressive. Um, however, to think that the level of biodiversity and ecological health that he is nurturing um, is equivalent to or better than leaving the land alone, there's where the hubris comes in. So it's really a point of comparison. I see, yeah. 